Thanks a lot. Thanks for the introduction. I'm Tim Bomber from Creative Commons and Cables back there. Who's coming back up? We're going to do a little tag team on our presentation today. Uh, we already heard a little bit about the Department of Labor grant program uh, this morning from Martha Cantor and Jim Shalton and others throughout the day. So we're just going to provide an update on the project work that Creative Commons and its partners uh, will be providing to the uh, successful uh, uh, win the winning grantees. So a, a little bit of acronyms, um, which we've probably all seen before. Uh, the TAA CCCT <laughs> means uh, Trade Adjustment Assistance Community College and Career Training Grant Program. So what do you think? Uh, I think they've been calling it TACT. <laughs> Uh, and our consortium of services, which we're going to describe in a little more detail later, is called OPEN, Open Professionals Education Network. Uh, here's kind of an overview of what the things we're going to kind of cover today, and hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for Q&A before everyone piles out of the room. I'll talk a little bit about the history um, of the program. Cable will describe some of the services and the other groups that Creative Commons is working with. Then I'll describe a little bit of the timeline uh, that we have um, and the timeline going forward with the other <coughs> waves of the program. And we'll talk about one related project that Creative Commons is working on that ties into uh, these services. And then finally, Cable will end with um, some threats and some opportunities that we have with regard to this program and with regard to the, uh, uh, the innovative DOL grant program itself. So, uh, like I mentioned, the, the TAA uh, CCC training grant program is kind of grew out of a, a past program, um, which Hal Plockett and others have talked about before, probably at prior open ed conferences. Um, and in the U.S., this was through the SAFRA legislation, and SAFRA stands for uh, Student Aid Fiscal Responsibility Act, which uh, which was. Um, discussed in 2009, which would provide $50 million a year over 10 years for the creation of open educational resources. And there was a lot of back and forth on um, this bill. Um, eventually, the SAFRA legislation got attached to the, um, to the health care reform bill in the U.S. And if, anyone, if any of you followed that, you knew that it was very kind of contentious uh, back and forth. And in, in the end, the the $50 million over 10 years got stripped out of that, that uh, program once the health care bill was passed. But it kind of regrew, um, uh, reincarnated through the Department of Labor uh, through this TA CCC gr uh, grant program. And it's with the Department of Labor uh, in conjunction with the Department of Education. Uh, the program would essentially provide $2 billion over four years for the creation of uh, high quality content at community colleges. Uh, for those students and for worker retraining programs. And the real innovation came in the details of the program, and I guess we're probably all kind of familiar with this by now. Um, the requirement that any new resources created with grant funds be licensed under the CC BY license. And we really haven't seen this at the federal government level in the U.S., excuse me, much, and especially not at, at this scale. So one, once Creative Commons saw that this uh, program was announced, it was announced January 20th of this year, we, got, we were really excited, obviously, and we're like, this is a huge opportunity. And we actually kind of like took a little bit of a look at the uh, grant solicitation to see if CC could apply for grant money, because we realized that a lot of community colleges are going to be looking for guidance about what this actually means. What does it mean for me to apply Creative Commons licensing to our grant materials? And with $500 million in the first round, you know, we were like, man, I wonder how many colleges that could be. It could be, uh, it could take a lot of, a lot of effort. So we kind of pinged the idea around to some folks at the Department of Labor and read the grant solicitation very closely. We kind of realized that uh, CC wasn't in the position to apply for any of that money to be able to provide assistance. So we reached out to um, the Gates Foundation. We, we all know have been doing a lot of great work in OER over the last few years. <clears throat> see if they were interested in uh, funding a, a sort of consortium to be able to provide this technical assistance uh, to the grantees to really make sure that we, we get this program right. You know, it could provide a really good precedent um, kind of going forward. So our, our consortium, the Open Consortium, is going to provide uh, assistance to all 
the Department of Labor uh, grantees. Uh, and the leads are going to be Creative Commons, um, CAST, uh, Carnegie Mellon's Open Learning Initiative, and then finally the Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges. And Cable's going to just talk a little bit about, uh, a little more in-depth about the description of the services that we're going to be providing. Thanks, Tim. Uh, hi, everybody. How are you doing today? So uh, just to build on what Tim was saying, when this, uh, when this grant came out and the CC BY license was required on the grant, uh, many of us in the open community said, uh, this is the precedent-setting moment in open policy um, for, at least in the United States, it was a first. Uh, not a first globally. Other countries are way out in front of the U.S. in, in working with open policy, Netherlands being one of them. Um, but, but this was a big deal in the U.S., and to the extent that it was $2 billion of public money, it was a big deal globally. And so, um, as Tim said, we uh, at, at Creative Commons, and I was at the State Board at the time, um, saw this not only as, as proper public policy, when public funds are used, the, the works that are produced with public funds should be either put directly into the public domain, or they should have a, a very open uh, license on them so that they can be used, revised, remixed, and redistributed. <coughs> um, so t to the extent that we want these grantees to be very successful and we want them to have all the technical supports that they need, that's really where this, um, this consortia uh, came from. So uh, the, what I'm going to do is kind of walk through uh, very briefly what each one of these partners uh, is going to do um, at, for, for the different EOL grantees. So Creative Commons, uh, probably pretty obvious, right? There's a requirement to uh, license with CC BY, so, uh, but that's, that's, as you know, is uh, slightly more complicated than just slapping the logo on a page, right? The, the licenses are machine readable, you can use the license chooser to put additional meta tag information in, um, all of that gets put into machine readable code and you, proper implementation of the license is like, you know, again, taking that code and getting it into the, the web page of the digital objects so that they can be found uh, on the web. And while we all know that it's not that difficult, if you don't know anything about open licensing, you don't know anything about CC, uh, that's, that's a bit of a hurdle. And to the extent that there's going to be a lot of stuff built uh, with a CC license on it, uh, you know, we want to do everything that we can to make sure that this, uh, this content is properly marked up. So that, that's one service we're providing. Another service um, is uh, helping with OER search and discovery. So um, I made some comments in an earlier session about um, it's good not to build everything from scratch, but rather the, the proper starting point is to ask what have others done that I might be able to use and iterate, iterate on and, and reuse uh, other people's uh, existing OER. Uh, and so we'll be assisting the grantees uh, with that task, sort of help, helping them know where are the uh, searches. How do you search for open license? What does that look like? Uh, to the extent that there are uh, uh, many grants that are similar in terms of the domains they're looking at. So there are multiple healthcare grants. There are multiple uh, clean energy job grants that have been given. Uh, we'll be doing some, some extra work to help find resources for them, uh, open textbooks, OERs that may be useful to them. So, so for example, uh, Carnegie Mellon you know, has uh, biology and chemistry courses, and those are prereqs to every single one of the nursing programs that has been funded <laughs> by the Department of Labor, and it would seem uh, silly, at least to us, that you would want to start from scratch building a brand new chemistry course um, when you could take, uh, there are lots of uh, OER chemistry courses out there that you should know about that, you should start with those. Um, we're providing other services as well, but I'll get to, well, I, I guess real briefly, CC is um, the, the project laid on this, so we'll be running conferences around this. Um, if you're a DOL grantee, we'll be running a kickoff conference and a closing conference. The kickoff conference to really walk them through all these services in great detail. It'll be a multi-day conference. We're going to bring everybody in the United States together um, so that they can meet each other, but also so that we can really articulate uh, what the services that we're going to provide and then adjust our services to meet their needs. So we'll be surveying them in advance and meeting with them at the Department of Labor kickoff, which is going to happen for us. Open Learning Initiative also, you, you can probably guess, um, they're going to be bringing their expertise in uh, best practices in instructional design, in uh, collecting data on curriculum, and using the, the feedback loops um, that Carnegie Mellon um, has, has been working on for multiple years. Um, some of these things have been explicitly called out, just like the CC BY license was explicitly called out in the grant. There was a section that talked about um, you know, continuously assessing effectiveness of the strategies in order to improve the program and build 
evidence about effective practice. So to the extent that this is really called out in the grant to have somebody like Carnegie Mellon with some expertise in thinking about how do you collect data on your students' use of the courseware, and then how do you use that data to iteratively improve the course in future revisions. Uh, Carnegie Mellon is also going to, um, so, so that's their model, and we all know their four feedback loops. Um, Carnegie Mellon is also going to provide really three levels of service, and so is CAST. And so let me take a moment just to be clear about this. I guess I should stay over here so you can hear me. Um, we are going to provide a level one service to all of the grantees. And, and there are how many grantees? 32 this first one. 32 plus, and we're guessing another five or six. So we're probably going to have 40 grantees or so by the time. So for all 40 grantees, everybody gets a set of services. And that includes all the Creative Commons services, um, all the services the state board will be providing, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, and then a, a set of services from CAST on accessibility, and a set of, uh, sort of general <coughs> instructional design best practices from Carnegie Mellon. Carnegie Mellon and CAST are going to provide also level two and level three services to smaller groups of grantees. So level two services for <laughs> Carnegie Mellon is essentially, if you'd like to use the Carnegie Mellon platform, uh, the tools, the cognitive tutors, all their back-end um, artificial intelligence stuff they've got for your curriculum, but you want to build your own stuff, that's kind of level two service. And they provide support around that, and CAST is in there working uh, deeper on accessibility issues with folks. And then level three is kind of the full Carnegie Mellon and CAST treatment. I mean, they're at your campus, they're working with your folks, they've traveled to you, they're an integral part of your team, and it's, I don't know if you know, but Carnegie Mellon spends on average four or $500,000 each course they develop. Uh, and it's a very intense process. And so they're gonna do that with a very small subset of the grantees, probably three, four, five of the grantees. And what will be, what Carnegie Mellon CAST and our project will be looking for as to who should those folks be, we're looking for uh, collaborations across the project. So to the extent that there might be, say, three nursing uh, programs that are funded, that would be a natural place to say, like, let's not do three different nursing programs three different ways. Is there a chance to build something uh, with a much, uh, with more resources, with more sort of intense support uh, that you can all leverage and use? Uh, CAST, as I mentioned, uh, this is a group out of uh, Cambridge, uh, well known for their expertise and accessibility. Um, again, in the Department of Labor grant, uh, accessibility was explicitly called out um, as, um, as a requirement in everything that's produced. And so CAST will also be providing those three levels uh, of service. And to prepare for this project, even before the grantees were named, CAST has been working very closely with Carnegie Mellon Open Learning Initiative to adjust the OLI platform to be much more accessible than it currently is. And that's been a, a challenge and a, a problem with the OLI platform, and I think they would freely admit that. And CAST has identified uh, many things that could be better from an accessibility standpoint. And so they, they, their technicians have already been working uh, together. CAST, of course, has a set of best practices. This is an example of what they will bring to all of the grantees, as you know, their, their documents, their brochures, their one pagers, but also webinars to go with that, and some light consulting for everybody. And then if you're at level two or level three in the services, you get much more hands-on, um, you know, face-to-face -face interaction with their teams. Uh, the State Board, and, and I know the Connie step up, she already left. Uh, State Board, uh, this is where I was when we started writing the grant. So we said, um, basically, uh, look, the State Board has done some things uh, around our open course library project, which was all about developing uh, an entire general education curriculum and putting a CC BY license on it. We, we encountered some barriers, uh, as you might imagine, some struggles, some challenges, and we overcame those successfully in working with uh, the legislature, in working with presidents and trustees and faculty and faculty unions and student leadership and uh, provosts and I mean we there are different conversations, different challenges, different solutions, different <laughs> barriers at all of those levels and the state board um, has struggled through that and uh, been very successful over the past couple of years and so there's a lot of uh, best practices to share there that these grantees will also struggle with and so that's part of the reason the state board's there. Um, they're also there really to talk about um, adoption strategies um, and you know not mandates, but uh, what sort of incentives and carrots can be put in place? How do you set the proper context 
so that uh, people move uh, from not embedded here to yes, I'm you know, very eager to use somebody else's high quality materials. Um, and they've got a lot of experience with that. And then this last one I think is particularly interesting. Um, I don't know if this is true in universities uh, around the world, but in community colleges in the United States, almost every community college system is adopting some kind of performance-based funding policy, which essentially says if your outcomes, if your student completion rates go up, if your other key performance metrics that you've identified as being important go up, then your base budget will benefit from that. And if, you, if they go down, your base budget will be negatively affected. And this has become uh, something that many, not all, but many community colleges have engaged in this conversation. In Washington State, we engaged, we, we connected this idea with adoption of high quality OER that helped those performance metrics. And some of those metrics include affordability for students. And so there's an interesting nuanced conversation in the policy realm that the state board is uniquely uh, has lived that and, and uh, wanted to share those. Do you want to share yeah. Sure. A little bit uh, more on the timeline. Uh, Cable alluded to it. Uh, Wave 1 is launched as of September 26th, I believe. The Department of Labor announced uh, 32 grantees. Here's where they are right now. Almost $500 million was expended. Um, the grant awards range from $2.5 million uh, up to $20 million for a consortia application. Um, as you can see, some of the states uh, haven't been represented yet. The department is working with them um, to submit an application if they haven't already because it is written into the program that all states will receive at least $2.5 million. Um, Cable had uh, mentioned the Department of Labor is actually holding off kickoff meeting for all the winning grantees for Wave 1. Um, where they're going to be explaining the program to them, and then our consortia, the Open Project, um, is having a, a conference as well. Both of those dates are at TBA right now, um, just because the announcement was was made just a few <coughs> weeks ago. Um, it's kind of up in the air whether the Department of Labor is going to be accepting input on suggested changes uh, before Wave Two um, solicitation is released. Um, so we're going to be kind of watching that. They've already done a series of at least two web chats where the public can provide comments and suggestions via that format. Um, and we uh, obviously uh, contribute to that as well. Uh, wave two, uh, the solicitation for grant applications is also to TBA, but probably sometime this winter. Uh, they want to push the money out the door uh, before it goes away. Um, each wave is going to be lasting uh, three years, so that's an important uh, piece to, to remember. So, uh, you know, the completion of all four waves could be pushed out to, what, 2016, 2017? Uh, I want to talk about one related project that we're working on that came about in the interim after the department uh, announced the DOL grants, and that's the Learning Resource Metadata Initiative. Um, and this initiative is in collaboration with the Association of Education Publishers. And it's really, its goal is to uh, build a common metadata vocabulary for educational content. And we all know that the OER uh, search and discovery has been a really tough nut to crack. Uh, we hope this will be a piece of, uh, of that puzzle. Um, the kind of, the origination of, of the idea is obviously, you know, teachers and students, if they can't find high quality materials, uh, you know, what's the point? and everyone's using web scale search to, to find things these days, uh, we need to be able to enable um, some of those things. Uh, I should also note that uh, this process is happening in public, and uh, we have a, a draft uh, schema of the properties that are being discussed right now, and it's at the, the URL at the bottom of the page. You can comment on those uh, draft properties if you wish. The way the properties, uh, with the way the schema would work, uh, this is an analogy where you can go on Google right now, type in something like potato salad recipe. And if you look on the, the, the navigation bar on the left, it'll pull up this little nice little checkbox to allow you to choose um, what you want in your potato salad, be it mayonnaise, mustard, strangely also potatoes on there. Um, <laughs> uh, but this is essentially how, uh, how LRMI would work for educational content, be able to filter uh, based on different properties. Um, including things like um, 
uh, learner age, license, which would be uh, really useful, obviously. Um, a set of 10 to 15 um, different tags. Oh, of course, and we should note that uh, we're going to be helping the uh, DOL grantees to mark up their content with the uh, LRMI schema. So, Cable wants to talk about the final uh, point, threats and opportunities. Yeah, so this is part of the discussion where Cable gets angry. <laughs> because people are writing things like this and putting it into bills in the, in the U.S. Congress. So, um, so I think it was Gandhi who said um, that when, you, when you're starting uh, something new that's hard and is challenging and is, is, uh, is world changing, first they ignore you, uh, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. And so we're in phase three uh, of that sequence. And so the, um, uh, I thought that, um, it, it, without naming anybody in particular, the, really what's going on, and I think we all are clear on it, is there are a set of uh, tools that we now have in the 21st century, um, mainly the affordance of digital things, uh, open licensing, um, the internet, um, the want of many people around the world to share uh, their creative works, uh, and for information generally to want to be free. Uh, there's also simultaneously a massive want for educational opportunity. And I'll save my, my speech for uh, Thursday morning on those topics, but nevertheless, um, the, there are also a uh, large number of um, existing businesses that make their money primarily based on 20th century models. Three minutes, okay, thanks. And, and those 20th century models are, are essentially based on scarcity of information and, uh, and gatekeeping information, selling access to that, that limited information. Well, we, we all know in the room that um, digital resources um, are not limited, in fact, are non-rivalrous. <clears throat> and you can make a billion copies of these PowerPoint slides at uh, almost no cost, uh, very close to zero, and we can send them around the world at no cost. So um, this is very challenging to existing business models, and those business models are starting to fight. And, uh, and this is one of the most recent things. We, uh, we put this particular challenge up because it directly affects the Department of Labor grant that we've been talking about. Um, and as you can read in the, the bold color, this would essentially say that um, you, uh, nobody who gets a Department of Labor grant may use those funds to build anything. It's silent on open license, as you notice, but you just can't build anything if there's a commercial option um, available that you can buy off the shelf, or if there's one that's potentially under development. So, so let's put this in practical terms. Oh, and by the way, the Secretary of Labor has to certify the search that you've done, and only then are you allowed to build anything. So you can see it's a, it's a bit ridiculous, um, but it, this, is the, um, this is the response to, uh, to what's going on, to this broader open policy that says, uh, publicly funded works should be freely and openly available to the public, us, that pay for it. So, um, so this is a challenge. Um, the, uh, there are many people working on this from many different angles right now. Um, I, I see, uh, just reading this, I see a couple uh, big ways forward. One of them is to have the language removed, um, and, and that might happen. Um, and another uh, way, frankly, is to uh, potentially reverse the language. Right. So it would say something like, uh, none of the funds may be used to, um, to buy uh, any resources until a complete and comprehensive search of all you know, open education, <laughs> openly licensed materials, uh, or anything that we might have under development. So I say that a bit tongue-in-cheek, but that's often what happens in legislative negotiations, is they'll use the same language and just tweak the words. But, 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 let's, but let's be serious about it and look at what this would really mean. So this would actually mean that, so I'm from Washington State, if Shoreline Community College had really a great idea about developmental math, and they had something that was really proven, and they were collecting data on it, and they think that they want to share it, and that they wanted to get a Department of Labor of grant to take, to take it to scale and take it to the next level, uh, what this law would actually say is, no, you're not allowed to do that, uh, because McGraw-Hill or Pearson or somebody else also offers developmental math that you're going to have to buy and they're going to own the copyright, and you're going to have to pay them licensing rights year after year. And so I'm sorry that you've got this great innovation, but you can't have a grant uh, to add on to it or, or build anything because it's off the shelf. So you can sort of see that this is a, a little bit over the top, but 
nevertheless, it's there and it's, it's real and it's um, currently in the house uh, built. And so, um, probably enough said on that for now. Um, but there, um, you know, we are, the point of the slide is that um, we need to be, we the open community at large, need to be ready to um, voice our opinions about things like that. Um, and the good news about us is that we are large. Um, we are rather passionate folk. Um, and we don't mind uh, stepping up to challenges uh, like that. So, um, so uh, without going into any specifics, don't be surprised if you're called upon um, by somebody in the future to, uh, to voice your opinion. Um, and as Tim said, there are, and you heard this this morning from the Department of Education folks, there are formal process opportunities that take place in any government. And, and uh, Jim Shelton talked about it this morning. There's, there's open comment periods. There are opportunities uh, that are a matter, just a part of the process that they go through, um, where you can voice your opinions, where it's logged into the public record, where you can, as a citizen, as a taxpaying citizen, you can, you can voice. Um, a couple final points. Uh, one is that uh, we at Creative Commons believe that uh, this is a good policy. Not that last slide. We think that this one's garbage. But we think that this, that what the Department of Labor is doing, um, is, is really on the right track. Uh, they're saying very clearly, that public funds should be openly and freely, but the, the works created with public funds should be open uh, educational resources. Um, if you're interested in, in that topic, that open policy topic, I'll be giving a keynote on that on Thursday morning uh, at 8.30. And if you'd like uh, more information about what Tim and I uh, have been chatting about, Creative Commons has a just kind of a placeholder page. We'll be putting up a full website on this project. Uh, and then the Department of Labor also has a website that as they put out new information, uh, it's all up there. And by the way, uh, they will be posting the full proposals of all of the winning grantees if you're interested in looking at those. Um, we don't know yet. That's still TBA too, but um, fairly, fairly soon. Uh, of course, these slides have all been put directly into the public domain. And if you have any questions for either Tim or me, uh, that's our contact information. That's where we tweet. And uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you.